afternoon. I'm, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm very honored uh, to be here this afternoon. So thank you for inviting me. Um, my um, relation to Clyde is perhaps more recent than for many of you. Um, I've been involved in two initiatives in recent years <coughs> with Clyde. Uh, one is a, a monitoring network on ECD that I've... Oh, thank you. Uh, that Clyde initiated uh, some years ago, so, uh, and he led uh, for, for a few years. So uh, we worked together, and uh, I must say that he was um, quite, a, quite an inspiring person to work with, and very fun, uh, very intense always. And the other initiative, and that's my starting point, is a uh, more recent uh, um, demand from the uh, Royal Society, of Canada of um, a kind of a re review of literature, a panel of experts that I had the privilege of uh, co-presiding with Clyde. Uh, many of the, the, the person who participated, uh, colleagues are, are here. So, and that was, that was great fun. I learned a lot about his capacity for synthesis. So I, I would describe him, the best way to describe it, I think is he was really a beautiful mind. And to me, the mind in, in includes the soul, so that's for that. Um, so what I'd like to do today is maybe, I don't have uh, the time to talk about everything that's in, that's in the report. I would <laughs> uh, incline, uh, suggest that you read it uh, if you have time, uh, but, I'll, but I'll take the, part, the portion that I know most, most about, about is the, uh, the question of longitudinal research. So, and what I'd like to do is simply to describe how the new generation of longitudinal research can inform uh, policy. Um, the, uh, I, use, I will use, I will illustrate very briefly uh, some of the results we, we, we got from <clears throat> some of the cohorts that we've been following in Quebec. Uh, they, are, they are illustrated here. Some of, we have many cohorts that we've started over the years, but these are the new recent ones that we've started, initiated in the 1990s. Around this time, in many places in the world, you had these new cohorts uh, that were initiated, uh, often uh, birth cohorts, but the idea was to get um, a more detailed assessment of the early years, the zero to six uh, years. So uh, we, according to this, we, we, uh, we started those cohorts. I'll be specifically uh, talking about the, the LDEC cohorts, the one that uh, is described up there. It's a singleton cohort. And we also have a twin cohort that I won't be talking about, which is ran in parallel. Um, the LDEC cohort um, is not by any mean uh, very impressive in terms of numbers. Uh, you have com you know, more numerous co cohorts that are more important in, in numbers uh, elsewhere in the world. But I think it's, it's, very, it's a very unique cohort in the quality of the follow-up, especially in the early, early years. You have at least six data points before school entry, uh, seven if you include kindergarten. And these are a plan to be omnibus cohort, so in, in the sense that we, we certainly want to assess the, the, big, the big triad that we should be assessing at that age, that is health, uh, social adjustment, and cognition, school readiness, if you like. Um, they, they do inform us in, in some ways. Uh, first of all, by, by documenting, so these are more informing policy indirectly, by documenting developmental trajectories, so I'll be showing some examples, and also developmental cascades and processes. So by having the, the virtue of having multiple time points gives you the possibility of assessing processes already uh, before school entry. Uh, and that allows us to point to sensitive period of change and possible targets of, of intervention. But also, and that was the case for LDEC, it's also, if you have information about the use of services, you can as, uh, you, you kind of as, can act, um, evaluate uh, the impact of these, uh, of these services over the population. And we were lucky enough to have uh, most of the kids, not most of the kids, but uh, a substantial portion of the kids uh, that we've started following who were entering daycare, the, the daycare system 
in Quebec was initiated at about the same time that we started LDEC. So that was an occasion, and I will be presenting uh, at least one slide on this. First slide, essentially trajectories. Uh, what you have here are three examples of trajectories that could be drawn uh, from the data collected uh, in the, these early years. Essentially, these are three examples. They could be, uh, you could be others. But the point I want to make here is that these three trajectories, they share at least two, two aspects. First, there's always a significant, small but significant group of kids who are showing high levels of either of aggression, of hyperactivity, of anxiety and depressed symptoms of anxiety and depression. So each uh, type of trajectories, they have their own dynamic, but, but you, you, you're always finding this small sample of kids. Now, this, this doesn't mean that this, is, uh, this won't change. Uh, as you add uh, data points, it is likely that you'll have less and less people on this high trajectory. But still, this is the first, I think, important thing to notice, the, the, the trajectory they get established very early. The other thing is that they don't intersect. So once the, the trajectory started, it, it tends to be on the same line. You have individual differences uh, that tend to be stable. And again, the curves can be different, but the, uh, these trajectories, they are established very early in life. What you can do, too, with these, uh, uh, provided you get information on the environment, is you can model the environment. Here, we've modeled uh, peer relationship, which is uh, peer relationship difficulty, essentially victimization, which is uh, an environment for the child. What is nice about this is that you, you can also identify a group of kids who are experiencing, and then look at the predictors. And if you look at the predictors, you see that you have uh, some uh, predictors like individual predictors, but also uh, uh, relational or uh, family-related predictors. So it's not that you have one single bullet explaining the nature of things but, and the nature of exposition to environment, but there's a variety of uh, risk factors that uh, kind of uh, get multiplied by the fact that there's a, an addition of risk factor over time. Uh, you can also assess uh, uh, um, processes, provided you get the, the, the good information. Here we looked at the relation between SES and school readiness, which uh, wasn't that great by, uh, by any chance. We, we, we had about 10% of the variance explain uh, the relation between SES and school readiness was about 10%, so it's not that, that huge. But still, we could uh, connect, explain uh, this association by essentially exposition to reading. So we were able to show that part of that associ association was accounted by exposition to reading, leading to expressive vocabulary and school readiness. So it's a way to identify potential target for intervention. Uh, I mentioned that we could assess uh, uh, interventions or services. Uh, a, a, great, uh, a great portion of our sample attended daycare. So we could compare their uh, school readiness uh, as a function of attending or not daycare. And here we found an interaction. So we controlling for all kinds of other factors that could explain a selection process. We, we found that uh, attendance of daycare uh, over five years was associated with increases in, uh, or better school readiness, uh, and, but only for family uh, of uh, uh, low education status. So there was an interaction. It's not a general effect that we found, but a, 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 an effect for maybe uh, family more at risk, which is pointing in the right direction. So longitudinal studies are telling us that Prevention should start strong in early childhood before problems get entrenched through cascading effects. Uh, it should persist over time, uh, universal, as we saw, but as well as targeted from other studies, uh, preventive interventions may have sustained positive impact, but policy-wise, uh, each approach 
each approach has its limitation. Uh, for instance, there are multiple uh, risk factors uh, to any problem, uh, traject problematic trajectory, so that targeting uh, a risk factor leaves many vulnerable uh, children behind. So that's a problem when you're dealing with uh, uh, targeting. If we had targeting, if we had targeting children on low SES, for instance, we would have left a lot of uh, children, vulnerable children, uh, 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 behind. On the other hand, universal interventions uh, are not necessar necessarily access uh, uh, universally. It's not by, because you have a universal uh, program that it will be accessed equally. And a good uh, slide for this is one taken from the uh, early year study. When they looked, that's uh, coming from uh, the National Longitudinal Survey of Children, where they compared Ontario and uh, Quebec in terms of access to ECE. That was before the new program of uh, K4, universal K4, implemented in Ontario uh, recently. But you could see that overall, if you provide uh, services, there's, you know, people will use it. But there's also a creation of a, of a, a kind of a, uh, a gradient associated with income in the sense that more affluent people will tend to use the service more. So this is a problem and we should be working towards um, kind of um, trying to solve this difficulty. So we should be aiming for proportional. The solution to that is that we should not, should not be opposing um, universal program to targeted program. What we need is what was suggested by in the Marmot report and that Clyde uh, insisted we, we, we consider in, in our report is proportional universalism. That is program services and policies that are universal but with a scale and intensity that is proportionate to the level of disadvantage in a given context. So just to finish, uh, Two, conclusion, two concluding remarks with respect to proportional universality. Uh, to get universality, you need, first of all, a, a political will and power to establish a basket of uh, services, and that will not come easily. So uh, at some point, there's, a, there's a, a political will and decision that has to be, to be made. That was made in Quebec. Uh, Hopefully, it will come in other uh, jurisdiction, jurisdiction in Canada. But then also, I think there is a sequence in the uh, event of thing if you want to move toward proportional, proportional universality. I think you need universality, universality first, and then work within a universe, universal system to add proportionality. So uh, there's a sequence to be respected in that. Uh, because if you go for uh, proportionate, you will never get universality. And for a sustainable uh, policy, we need, we need information on the system. And you need an integrated monitoring system, and that was the, 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 the vision of Clyde, uh, a system of developmental surveillance, uh, a kind of an EDI based on, on tools like the EDI, but EDI plus, going uh, maybe earlier in time to, to uh, measure development in children, and linking, linking this to population data. We also need an ECD policy assessment to measure the uptake of services by, in the population and access to the services in the population. And of course, you need longitudinal studies. Uh, this is the, uh, the network, the, the goal of the network that I talked to you about, the uh, uh, forum on early childhood monitoring. So I would invite you uh, to visit the site uh, where the vision of Clyde is, is laid out. So thank you.